Right now, a lot of homeschool researchers are asking this big question, right, about how do we get more folks to be a part of the data and more folks across all demographic areas. And so I think that those are areas where we'll see more traction and more um, engagement. And for myself, likewise, because as I said, you know, I study Black livingness in the American Southern Black Belt. And so as I continue to be a part of these conversations around Black homeschooling, that that will be uh, a part of it is, is what is the data? Who's a part of that data? What does that mean to be in that data? Are we asking the right questions of folks as we do that? So those are some of the things that I'm pondering right now. Welcome to Homeschool Talks, a podcast by HSLDA. This is a show about all things homeschooling, from practical tips to inspiring stories and everything in between. You can find show notes for this episode along with our other Homeschool Talks conversations at hslda.org forward slash podcast. And if you want to be the first to know about new episodes, as well as upcoming guests and topics, sign up for our email list using the link in the show notes. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we hope you enjoyed the program. Here's your host, Jim Mason. Hi, I'm Jim Mason, president of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and this is another episode of Homeschool Talks, where I talk to interesting people in the uh, world of homeschooling. And today, I'm excited to welcome my guest, uh, Dr. Timberly Baker. She is an associate professor at Air Arkansas State University in the Department of Educational Leadership. She's also a homeschool mom, and she's done... Um, some research on homeschooling, especially in amongst black families recently. So welcome, uh, Timberly. Thank you. So tell us about yourself. How did you end up being both uh, an associate professor and a homeschool mom? Yeah, so um, I started off my career in um, education as a middle school teacher in um, the Mississippi Delta of Arkansas. Um, I'm also black college educated, so I went to the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, um, which is a historically black college in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, um, Golden Lions. Um, and um, so in that process and trajectory, I really started paying attention to policy. And um, my first year teaching, I was put on the personnel policy committee for my district and was like, things have to change. Um, that was, and then that motivation sent me to graduate school and then into my PhD program. And I got my doctorate in educational leadership and policy and law from Indiana University, Bloomington. And then I worked for a while at, at the policy center there, um, the Center for Evaluation and Education Policy, where I was doing disproportionality and discipline and special education work. Um, and at the same time, starting my family. And um, so I was deeply interested in legislative choice and decision making. Uh, related to, at that time, discipline and special education, um, and then how that specifically impacted African-American students. Fast forward a little bit post uh, the doctoral degree and into uh, being a faculty member. Um, my first institution was Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, which is no longer still that, IUPUI, um, and then went to University of Southern Indiana in Evansville, Indiana, and then to Arkansas State University. And so at the time while I was in Indiana, I was still really focused on disproportionality in school discipline work. And I thought to myself, oh, well, I'll just port this work over, right? It was very urban focused. And I thought, well, I'll port it over to a rural and start looking at these same sort of factors and context, but in a rural context, because it there's that's there's absent, there's a gap in the research in that area. And so that's what got me interested in in rural was moving to Arkansas State University as a faculty member. And um, concurrent to that um, was I had a second, at that time, a second grader, uh, yeah, what second and fourth graders. And um, my fourth graders needs weren't being adequately met in the school system that we had decided to move into. And that presented its own sort of challenge. And I had gone to um, a school choice conference actually in Lisbon, Portugal and saw Cheryl Field Smith speak. And she talked about homeschool and split school and all these sort of different constructions around homeschool. And um, and I got back home and it gave me the energy to make some decisions. And so I actually started off as a split schooler. So my oldest, I pulled her out and started homeschooling her while my youngest was still enrolled in public school. And then when the pandemic hit, you know, everybody came home. So, 
So when my youngest came home, it was just really difficult to integrate her into our own homeschooling structures while she was still doing what the public school was requiring or asking of her. And so when um, once that academic year was over, we just decided to go ahead and homeschool both. And so that's how I became a homeschooler. I consider myself a bit of a reluctant um, homeschooler, but very much um, I'm all in now. So now my children are 14 and 16. Um, and, um, and they, you know, really engage in an inquiry-based curriculum for their homeschooling. Um, they have their standard core subjects that are provided to another curricular entity. Um, and then everything else they do is really around what they're interested in doing, what they're interested in examining, um, at that particular time. So each year, and some things carry over multiple years, right? But each year they have the opportunity to decide what their inquiry is going to be for a um, for a particular year. So that's probably a short version that could be longer of how I got to <laughs> where we are right now. Well, I think it's fascinating. Um, the number of people that I speak to kind of out on the homeschooling circuit and then even in interviewing in this podcast who are also homeschoolers, and I include myself in this, um, when I first uh, asked my wife to marry me and she agreed, it wasn't too long after that when, you know, we had the, are we going to have kids conversation? And she said, yes. And when we do, we are going to homeschool them. And so I, but I had not really uh, experienced much uh, of my adult life around children at all. So I kind of could figure out from context what homeschooling might mean. But I really had no knowledge of personal, in a personal sense of what that might mean. So I was in that camp of, even though we started right at the beginning, um, well, I'll, I was reluctant. I will try it out for a year or two. And then eventually I too uh, became sold out. And I think that's a very common experience. Um, and, 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 and would like to, uh, how, how much, how much, um, so you moved to um, um, Arkansas State, and that prompted your interest in rural education generally and or rural homeschooling in particular? So more so rural education in general initially. Um, and then in becoming a rural homeschooler, I guess, um, is what did And my, my research is sort of holistically around black livingness in the American Southern Black Belt at this time. And so homeschooling is one facet of that. Um, and so it was more so me really trying to say, okay, how can the research that I have already been doing um, be more targeted toward the type of institution that I'm now going to be a faculty member in? And, and that's what began that journey and in examining literature and et cetera and talking to folks. Like I said, there was just this gap in um, in the literature to examine that. And so then that sort of brought me to this place of saying, oh, we really need to build a space to do this work. And so now all of my work is fo is rural focused mm -hmm. within that. Right. Is then this conversation around homeschooling um, because I am an education scholar. So and then around homeschooling, which I personally identify with. And I'll tell you, at first um, talking to Cheryl Phil Smith about it, I was like, I don't want to research it and do it. You know, like I don't want to do both. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities that I've had to actually do both. So. Well, it sounds like uh, Dr. Cheryl Field Smith has been pretty influential in both your personal and professional life. Uh, it's been a couple, three years ago that I interviewed her here as well, and uh, she's at Georgia State, right? Uh, yeah, in Athens. So, how did you guys, you you and Cheryl Field Smith, decide to collaborate on this most recent uh, uh, study centering the lived experiences of rural Black homeschool families? Yeah, so um, I was in a previous data collection for her for some other work that she was working on. And I think I just, my researcher brain was asking bigger questions than my participant brain. You know, when you're a participant in a study, you're just, you, you give your answers and, you know, she did an excellent job of providing context and information as a participant. But because I'm also a researcher, right, I had sort of these other big questions that came out of the process of experiencing that um, because I um, was a, a rural black mother who was homeschooling. And so that's what her um, 
broader data collection was on. And so the, and she invited me to be a part of um, the study that you are referencing right now and to really examine these um, other perspectives um, around the experience of being a rural Black homeschooler. Is Jonesboro rural? No, I don't live in Jonesboro. So I do teach in at Jonesboro's campus, but I don't live in Jonesboro. In my experience of homeschooling, largely, um, you know, my homeschooling experience is with mostly white uh, Christian families. But it's also many homeschooling families tend to gravitate towards a more rural environment. And it, it, it seems to me, I mean, people live in towns and small towns, and but a lot of the things you talked about in your study, um, you know, attachment to the land and providing your own food and things like that seem um, common to my experience as well. Um, so how is it different in, in, in the uh, folks that you were uh, talking to? Yeah, so one of the things is the reason for homeschooling amongst Black families also includes this racialized protection piece um, that sometimes uh, public schools uh, don't provide when um, our participants the majority of them did not homeschool from birth, which is a, diff a distinction between many families that are racialized as white. Like your wife, you know, who was like, OK, if we have kids, right, we're going to homeschool. And um, and that generally is not or that's less common of a case for black families that they decide to homeschool from, you know, from conception but rather that there's some sort of complicating event that occurs in their um, schooling systems that um, provides the opportunity to do so. So while there's some children in those families who have always been homeschooled, oftentimes you'll hear, well, the oldest went to school first, right? And something occurred, um, their needs weren't met, they were racially profiled, there was some other sort of uh, race-based uh, protectionism that needed to uh, occur that may have prompted them to be homeschoolers. And like I said, that's not the case in everyone's, but that's one of the distinctions between those populations, as you just asked about. Uh, additionally, too, we see that in Black families that um, mothers are often far more, have higher levels of education than um, their um uh, their white counterparts that are mothers who are homeschooling as well. So there's some distinctions there too. But commonalities are also, you know, that a lot of times homeschool families also own businesses, right? And um, are entrepreneurial in nature. And so that's still true across both uh, demographics and um, even in the rural context, right? Um, and so I think those would be some of the distinctions that uh, are clear in terms of the rural context for how that might be different amongst the populations we're talking about. So you mentioned at the very beginning, you noted the, uh, you know, the tremendous rise in uh, homeschooling amongst black families. I mean, lots homeschooling generally grew a lot during the COVID times, but it was especially pronounced amongst black families. Is that a sea change, do you think, going forward? Um, I think so. I think we'll continue to uh, see that because sometimes, well, you know, and I just wrote a piece that's going to come out in the Journal for School Choice that's on the socio-historical context of Black home education, the American Southern Black Belt. And in that piece, I talk about this historical context by which Black families um, have been home educating in ways um, all the time from when we start from reading, teaching, you know, folks that are Black to read as being illegal and still folks teaching them how to read, right? And that's a home education process. And so in that, I think what we're going to begin to, to see is not just that, is that the, the ways in which homeschooling is traditionally defined um, becomes a little bit broader in how we understand what home education versus homeschooling means. And then um, Black families being a part of that movement uh, forward, but also the agency and ownership in order to be able to do that and do it really well. And so mm -hmm. I think it's something that we'll continue to see because a lot of people, regardless of your race, just felt more empowered to actually educate their own children due to having to because of COVID and was like, well, and I don't mean this flippantly, but like I can do this, you know what I'm saying? Um, in ways that I think previously uh, folks didn't feel empowered to be able to do. Yeah, that's that's. Um, I think a, it's a very strong hypothesis that that I have been advancing as well. That um, you know, homeschooling grew 
kind of steadily over decades, but not, you know, no big pronounced uh, spikes in growth. But then suddenly everybody was home with their kids mm -hmm. and they did discover both the that they could do more than they thought. They kind of discovered also what was, you know, they could see better what was going on in the public schools that their kids were going to. And lots of people who may have at one time said, oh, that's great that you homeschool. I could never do that. I don't have the patience to do that. I can't figure out how, you know. So then they figured out that they could. And so for all of the reasons that people, you know, choose to homeschool or continue to homeschool, there's a whole generation of families now that they, they experience it for a season. Even if they put their kids back into public school, it's always, it's, it's at least a half a step closer, maybe even more, you know, than it was before. And I think that's across, across this, the spectrum. Um, and, and then the other thing is, I think young families who maybe didn't have school aged children during COVID have a different view of what's possible as well. Yeah. And I think, too, that the other piece of that, um, you know, and um, I haven't looked at this data recently, but it's sort of the multifaceted way that homeschooling can get taken up. That's less of the sort of traditional imaginary of homeschooling has also contributed to that as well. Right. And so, you know, if I think back to when um, I was younger, the idea of what it meant to be homeschooled uh, is very different than that same idea now. Right. In terms of of what all you have to do in order to make that happen, you know, and and so feeling like you're certain, you know, a certain level of efficacy is necessary as a parent. Well, if I can't teach high school calculus, right, then I can't homeschool. And more so now it's like, that's, that's not an issue because I have all these other resources that I can access, especially remotely, that can fill in those gaps um, for, for my child. Um, which likely was always true, but just wasn't in the, you know, in the more generalized imaginary of people understanding how homeschool works. And one of the things I love, and as I talk to other people about, you know, homeschooling too, is sometimes, you know, they give me the, well, of course you can do it. You're a professor, you know what I'm saying? You, you're in education and so on. And, and I often say, you know, that we are, we are our child's, we are our children's first teachers anyway. So if you've already done much of this work in terms of teaching them what you think that they need to know, um, and you do it all the time anyway, where we have to disrupt um, our thinking is this idea that schooling happens in this sort of eight to three structure only, and that if it's not that, then it's not school. Right. And so once we get to helping folks um, disrupt that notion, then it becomes a much more broader conversation about the possibility of being able to homeschool. Um, and so I think that, that 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 those types of conversations and possibilities and opportunities are going to continue uh, as well in communities that we saw less numbers of um, homeschoolers previous prior to the pandemic. That's something you talk about in your uh, paper um, that. Rural uh, families, especially black moms who are homeschooling in rural areas, can feel a bit isolated. Um, talk about that some. Yeah, so we found that, and this was uh, true in my own experience as well, uh, was that many of them are not. Uh, so a, a literature piece in comparison to our uh, predominantly white counterparts is like co-ops and associations and et cetera is a very common factor in their homeschooling structures. Uh, whereas um, being in rural places, because you're already likely more isolated, just less population, right? That this was less likely to find um, other Black homeschoolers as well in your same area. So not that nobody's doing it, but just where you live, right? That that's what's occurring. And um, and so the, the challenge of that isolation is more for your children and yourself, because a lot of homeschooling dynamics play off of learning information from one another, right? So sort of, oh, what are you guys doing for third grade math? You know, oh, what are you using for, you know, 10th grade science or whatever? And that's a big dynamic of the homeschooling experience. And so when you're isolated um, with not same like peers, then that can be really challenging. The other piece is that many of those um, groups are also uh, uh, faith-based, 
And so while many of the families who are Black that homeschool are do identify as faith-based, it's not their primary reason for homeschooling. So then they're not necessarily looking for, you know, a church-based association or co-op to join in order to um to integrate into that process, but rather um, they're they're homeschooling for other reasons that are outside of that and that may center um, their own cultural backgrounds and being culturally responsive to their children in ways that, remember I said one of the racial dynamics is, is that sometimes there's been a complicated experience around race in the public school dynamics of so then joining a predominantly or all white co-op doesn't ameliorate that same issue. And so um, that's where that isolation piece can often come in. Is that changing as more um, Black families in rural areas uh, choose to homeschool? I don't know if it's changing in rural. So in urban spaces, we already see a lot of African-American co-ops. So there are not a lot, but more African-American cooperatives for homeschoolers and things like that. Um, I think what we see happening in rural spaces is uh, more opportunities for remote connections, meaning you don't live where I live, but we're still connected remotely. Um, and that's something that, that is uh, increasing as, as folks are examining and looking for supports in order to do this. Uh, heavy lifting of educating your children for the democracy and citizenry and it being powerful and important, but not necessarily local in the same ways that uh, we find in our white counterparts. You mentioned some other um, kind of ways that uh, homeschoolers kind of connect in rural settings with the broader community. Mm -hmm. Is that different or the same as other homeschoolers for black families? I'm not sure because I've never been anything but black. Well, I got news for you. I've never been anything but white either. <laughs> right. So I can't answer that part. Um, and so quite honestly, I, I, I don't know um, to be able to make that sort of comparison when I think about my own, like literally current experience of um, being a homeschooler. I don't I don't necessarily think so. You know, my children don't know many other uh mm. My oldest does now. So my children are also have, my oldest is a competitive gymnast. And so gymnastics is a very intense sport and et cetera. So there's, um, and she is now a part of a majority black gym. It's the only black gym in Memphis, Tennessee, which is um, close in proximity. And so um, there are other homeschoolers, black homeschoolers there. Uh, and that was a new experience to find them that way Right. But that wasn't like through a co-op. It wasn't through, you know, some other type of organization. It was through the sport that they that they love and are part of. And so I think that that's um, I think there's some more organic ways in which folks get connected um, more so than just being able to directly go to and say, hey, you know, let me Google a co-op and then join that or um, whatever name, you know, folks use for that type of or, or, or association. Um and so I think that that's a part of it. Some of the other Black families that I've also met have been um, in our local athletic uh, home education association for athletics so that uh, they can play sports. Um, but there's very few of us as well in that regard, too. So so that's why I think the sort of locus of connection, at least as of right now, in my experience, just specific to my experience, has been more remote connections um, than it has been localized connection that's easily accessible through, like a, like I said, like a co-op or something like that. Yeah. In my family's experience living in a rural area, there was a, a lot of connection with the community through things like 4-H and um, the rec league sports things that you're talking about. And my kids ended up playing a lot of sports more organized with a private Christian school that allowed homeschoolers to compete on their teams and just building that community that maybe, you know, within homeschooling circles, but then broad, more broadly out into the community, especially if you live in a rural setting is, uh, well, it was really important for my family and my kids growing up. It is. And I'll say, you know, one thing about, and this may be your experience, I'm not sure what part of the country that you're from, but in the South, high school sports, baby, are like pro sports, right? So, so you know, being sort of disconnected from the local public school context of sporting events and et cetera, um, influences those connections as well. And I bring that up explicitly because 
Um, even though I have two very athletic children who are um, very engaged in their in their sports, they both play. Uh, well, my oldest is a gymnast, as I said, which is not a high school sport, you know. So, um, so that already sort of wouldn't put her in that context. But I think one of the things that happens in rural spaces is is that the high school the school is such a um, an entity that brings folks together, Friday night lights, all of that kind of thing, um, which is really true and ongoing, right, even now. And so then when you homeschool, it diminishes that connection to that type of um, communal energy, right? Um, and so I think that that's a part of what influences sort of that sense of isolation in the context of um, Black homeschools. I also think culturally it's a challenge. Um, you know, um, it's my father, who is a retired public school educator, was very much initially against um, me homeschooling my children, um, as was my in-laws at the time. And just so it was a it was a cultural push against uh, my own upbringing and background to make that type of choice uh, as well. And so I think that influences the isolation, too. But my dad is 1000 percent on board and will do anything to help his grandchildren. So while the concept of homeschooling was like, we don't do that, the ideas behind how it really um, promotes the needs of his granddaughters very individually and holistically, uh, he's all in and all for. And my parents actually do um, language arts for my children. It's interesting. I uh, met some friends of mine, uh, Chris and Aziza Butler from Chicago, Southside Chicago. He's a pastor, and um, he and his wife started a kind of a homeschool resource center for their uh, constituents and 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 you know in their in their neighborhood in the south side of Chicago. And when I interviewed her, you know she she was like uh, she was uh, uh, trained as a public school teacher, and it was her whole life's ambition from a little girl to grow up and be a public school teacher. And then she started having babies, and she was like, "Oh, I don't want to do that. I want to homeschool my kids." And then she she says, and but do black people even do that? I don't do black people even homeschool. <laughs> and she knew she wanted to, but it was a leap even for her to think that that was a thing that she could do. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, you know, there's always pockets of individuals who have always been doing this work. So I'm, I don't want to diminish those who are generationally um, homeschooled that come from black communities that are racialized as black. Uh, but I think more holistically, sort of culturally, and even for my dad, who's in his 70s and fought for integration, um, is very much like I fought for the right for y'all to go to school. Why would you choose not to right to go to public school? Why would you choose not to? And these were real conversations that we were having about him sort of acclimating his understanding into what this distinction means to to home educate. Um, versus sending them to public school. And for him, some of that was about what he had felt like he had fought for and did sit-ins for and and was arrested for and went to Vietnam for. And, you know, so um, it brought up quite a bit of um, a lot of different things for um, for our families, like outside of the household, right? For our families in the context of making the decision to to homeschool. But in rural places, what we have to remember is that schooling options are so minimal. So it's not like you really have sort of this bonanza of school choice that's available to you in relationship to making other decisions. So if your local public school isn't really working for you, what, you know, what are your real options in terms of, um, you know, mileage, right, sort of what's around you to be able to do that. In our context, there's one uh, private Christian school uh, that's in the next town over, um, and and that wasn't a viable option to meet our needs. And so, so that was it, like literally, that was it, right? Um, and so when you start to think about it in those terms, this is where the rural context really does matter and shows up a little bit differently. Because if we were in an urban space, then we might have had more of a bonanza to choose from when, you know, the the, the option that's closest to our home doesn't work. Right. Then maybe we can go some other places that are within the city or county or whatever. But being in a rural place, that's just not available to you. So what do you think won your dad over? Um, the intellectual capability of my children, when he saw how quickly they were able to um, move in ways that was one, 
directed specifically at the interest that they had, right, in sort of the inquiry based context. And then um, two, that they were genuinely like enjoyed the process of learning. Um, whereas I think, unfortunately, like homework was like a, I got to do homework, you know, like that whole thing, right, in terms of school homework, right? But now when all the work is the learning and that learning is centered on what your interests are, then it just hits different. And so I think for him, it was very much being able to to see that the ways in which they were critical thinkers um, at a younger age than what he had taught. They um, So my dad was a middle school teacher and my kids were not in middle school yet, but critically thinking above the students that he had worked with for a long time. And so I think it was some of those things that really won him over. Um, my oldest is a, both of my children are really good writers and storytellers. Um, and I think that really impressed him in terms of the quality and their command of, um, of written language that had they been pacing alongside just sort of the public schooling structure, they wouldn't have been there yet. So I think it was, it, it was several things um, that just sort of brought him to a different type of energy around what it meant to be able to to homeschool that and also because they got a lot more opportunities to be present for the big moments in life in our families as well because they weren't tied to you know attendance at school and um and what it means to love and be um to be a part of all the things that you sometimes miss when you have school-aged children because well, I can't pull them out of school or they, you know, I don't want them to miss school or whatever. And ours was just pick up your work and let's go, you know, <laughs> and let's go. And so we got there to be be there for a lot of things. And and um, and then one last quick thing is my oldest uh, was is a severe asthmatic. And so um, prior to starting homeschool, she had to be hospitalized for her asthma every year. And then we started homeschooling and she has not been hospitalized since. And so I think that, you know, the lack of exposures to certain germs and all, just all the things that sort of is in the conglomerate of schools and not in a negative way. I mean, I am not anti-public school at all um, has been has been different. But I think that those are the things that have contributed to his shift in how he sees um public school. And I'm an advocate for public schools because I recognize that the majority of folks who look like me do not have the option or access or resources potentially to uh, to home educate. And so it's a both and, not an either or. One of the things in your paper that I found to be fascinating, and I, I hope you'll uh, talk a little bit about it, is um, the way you approached the people that you, this qualitative study that you uh, talked to, about a dozen uh, Black homeschooling moms in sister circles that that is tell, talk talk about that some so a sister circle is a black feminist methodological approach and in short it's just coming together to fellowship and it's sort of the conversational um interactional uh things that you would have if you just brought people if you said hey i'm having to get together at the house and folks showed up, right? And so it's sort of that energy that you come together around. And in that, you have some targeted conversations, just like if somebody brought up, you know, a question of uh, of, of intense debate, you know, at a family get together or at a, a friend get together. And so, so that the sister circle methodological approach is really about connecting folks. It's about a laid back, but fellowship type interaction where we're learning from and with one another, where we're talking about important things, but it's not so researchy, right? Where it's sort of this question, answer, question, answer, or I'm the researcher and you're the participant, but rather we're all here in this space, enjoying one another's company and having strong conversations about these questions that we've identified early on and everybody gets to answer, you know, there's not like a, well, as the researcher, let me hold myself back from being engaged in the conversation, but rather, you know, my experiences can be a part of that conversation as well. And, you know, as a researcher, you are cognizant of making sure that the participants, you know, are have their airtime, but it's a very, um, uh, different and more culturally nuanced and uh, more um, 
culturally aligned approach to data collection. Um, so instead of a focus group, a more formalized focus group, right, uh, to have a sister circle. And it was so enjoyable. And many of us still talk, um, are still connected. Uh, because it was just a wonderful time to to be with one another. And ours was on Zoom. Best case scenario to actually do this approach is to literally bring everybody together physically around a meal um, and to, to have a meal together, break bread together and uh, fellowship and talk. Yeah, I, I just found that to be fascinating as, as uh, you know, we're in political season. And so you're always hearing about focus groups, this and focus groups, that. And you got the guy up front and he's, you know, it's, it's all very... Uh, kind of directed and quite quite different from what you describe in this paper. Yeah. So here we are, you know, COVID is receding into the background. Um, I think it made some dramatic changes in many ways that we may still yet to discover in uh, family life and rural life, city life, all kinds of life. Uh, what's, what's up next for you um, in, in this area of research? Yeah. Um, so actually right now, um, sort of trying to figure out a couple of different things. Mm. Right now, a lot of homeschool researchers are asking this big question, right, about how do we get more folks to be a part of the data um, and more folks across all demographic areas. Right. But there's some concentration, um, intense concentration on individuals who are racialized, non-white. Right. So black families, Hispanic families, especially um, and so I think that those are areas where we'll see more traction and more um, engagement. And for myself, likewise, because, as I said, you know, I study black livingness in the American Southern Black Belt. Um, and so as I continue to be a part of these conversations around black homeschooling, that that will be uh, a part of it is, is what is the data? Who's a part of that data? What does that mean to be in that data? Um and how to and are we asking the right questions of folks as we do that? So those are some of the things that I'm pondering right now. Uh, what I continue to see myself also doing is, you know, I've got probably about three to four more years with my youngest to still be homeschooling. So so I got some time to <laughs> it's not like I'm out of it yet. You know, um, my oldest is graduating at 16, so she'll be done this year. Um, and so I think some as things come up. Uh, related to my children as well, that that will also inform uh, the next projects for me. But most immediately is sort of this big question around data. Do you uh, have any hypotheses for how things will uh, progress now that we're kind of receding farther and farther away from the post-COVID era? I don't. I think our um, how educational savings accounts and ESAs and state level support legislation and policy um, gets rolled out in different states is going to impact the answer to that question, maybe more so than just the receding of COVID. Um, and and so, I, as I said, when we first started, you know, I think we'll continue to see in this a more steady increase of Black families. You know, we saw this huge rise, right, you know, um, during COVID for everybody, but that we'll see a more steady increase. Uh, I think we'll continue to see a more steady increase of Black families who are home educating uh, as COVID, you know, as, as that recedes, um, that going up. Uh, and that's my hypothesis for, for right now, that I won't be out of a research area anytime soon. <laughs> There'll be plenty of people to to conversate with, to engage with, to learn from, um, and to learn with. Well, very good. Any uh, last words you'd like to add? Um, just that, you know, I hope that the work that uh, we continue to do as researchers, but more importantly, as parents and as families, continue to impact, you know, our nation and the democracy that we have and how we're really working toward building a citizenry that's a productive citizen and to not lose sight of that. Um, because in all these uh, conversations, legislation, policy, et cetera, is that it's really about the children and, um, and the families and them doing their best in order to provide the type of education that they see fit for their families. Yeah. I think you say this in your paper, and I hardly agree, um, traveling all over the country, talking to parents of all, all you know, educational choices, races, and so forth. Parents, as a rule, want what's best for their kids. Absolutely. We in homeschool world want to make it possible for as many uh, families who choose that to do it and do it successfully. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. 
So thanks again to my guest, Dr. Timberly Baker, uh, Associate uh, Professor at Arkansas State University. And we've been talking about some of her research uh, in uh, rural black homeschooling. And uh, we uh, welcome you to uh, come and look at uh, HSLDA as well. We'd love to have you join us. Um, if you're interested in joining us or perhaps donating to our cause here, you can go to our website at hslda.org. We'd love to have uh, your support as we work to make homeschooling possible for as many families who uh, choose to do it so they can do it as well as possible for their kids and for the country. So thanks again. Yep, thank you. Every week, HSLDA hears from hundreds of homeschool families, many of whom are facing hostility from school officials or discrimination from colleges and employers. We've helped single parents facing criminal charges for homeschooling their children, families traumatized by wrongful CPS investigations, and even a grandmother harassed by the state for homeschooling her granddaughter. By donating to HSLDA, you can help make homeschooling possible for families like these and enable our work to preserve freedom for future generations. Give today at hslda.org forward slash donate. That's hslda.org forward slash donate. Thanks for listening to this episode of Homeschool Talks. If you've enjoyed this conversation, will you do us a favor by sharing it with a friend or leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts? As a reminder, you can find show notes for this episode along with our other Homeschool Talks conversations at hslda.org forward slash podcast. And if you want to be the first to know about new episodes, as well as upcoming guests and topics, you can sign up for our email list using the link in the show notes. That's all for now. We hope you enjoyed this program and we'll see you next time.